All right, so we've been talking about the periodic table. We've been talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons, and how those have impact on the properties of atoms. What we're going to look at today is some of the patterns that we see on the periodic table and why the periodic table has been arranged the way it is. When Mendeleev first put together the periodic table, most of the elements that were known were metals, and so they were able to do lots of experiments with those. They didn't have quite the same understanding of nonmetals yet, um, but over time that would start to be developed and that would come. In a few years after Mendeleev, a lot of things were developed, a lot of things were changed, and so we see these patterns that began to develop, and that's why it's called the periodic table. Everything within a group tends to have similar characteristics. So the four big patterns that we look at in first year chemistry are these four that you see on the board. Reactivity, atomic size, ionization energy, and electronegativity. Each of these has a trend based on the type of element that we are looking at. So what we're going to look at here first is we'll look at reactivity. So what does reactivity mean? Well, what we mean by reactivity is whether or not that thing reacts vigorously or if it just kind of reacts a little bit. For metals, that reactivity is going to be related to size, and we'll talk more about that when we look at atomic size. But the larger the atom is means that the valence electrons are going to be further from the nucleus, valence electrons being those outermost electrons. So when you go down a group, they will in turn react more vigorously. But for the nonmetals, that trend is actually reversed. The reason for why is going to be talked about in both trends three and four. Um, but for right now, the biggest thing you need to know about is as you move down a group, a metal is going to become more reactive. So lithium reacts with water vigorously, it kind of fizzes and gives off hydrogen gas. Sodium will react a little more vigorously and it'll give off more gas and a little bit more energy. And then potassium will usually catch on fire and spark up and so you can't even, you don't want to do that in a chemistry classroom, it's a little bit more dangerous than something we would like to do. We want to, don't want to put your lives in our own hands. For the nonmetals, the trend is the other way around. For nonmetals, the higher on the periodic table it is, the more reactive it will be. Uh, remember, nonmetals include all of the noble gases. So the noble gases, they don't really want to react at all. And so we can't say that it's anything across a row or up or down. The reactivity is literally different both for metals and nonmetals. And it becomes more reactive for a metal as you move from right to left and it becomes more reactive for a nonmetal as you move from left to right. Fluorine is the most reactive of all of the nonmetals. Oxygen and chlorine are very similar. They're both high and further to the right. Um, things like arsenic and antimony, which are right in the middle of that uh, chain of metalloids, they are not as reactive. So that is your first trend. Reactivity increases as you move down for a metal, and it increases as you move up for a nonmetal. The second trend is called atomic size. It is how large an atom is. So essentially we're looking only at one thing. How far do the electrons get away from the nucleus? The farther the electrons are from the nucleus, the greater the size of that atom will become. So there's a couple different things that we have to think about here. When we add more protons, we are also adding more neutrons. If you recall, the protons and neutrons, not neutrons, protons and electrons, have to be the same number for a neutral atom. So the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. So we would think, okay, I'm adding in more protons, I'm adding in more neutrons. I keep saying neutrons and I mean electrons. We keep adding more electrons while we're adding protons, so we would expect the entire thing to get bigger. But remember we talked about electron configurations, and we said that there are different energy levels. As long as I am putting electrons, into the same energy level, the size of that is not going to increase. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The size decreases. What ends up happening is there are more protons in the nucleus, and thus they have a little bit stronger of an attraction on the electrons that are surrounding it. So it, they start to pull in on those electrons a little bit firmer, a little stronger, and the atom actually gets a little bit smaller. So lithium is actually a little bit larger than beryllium. Sodium is a little bit larger than magnesium because there are more protons in the one to the right, but those electrons are not any further away from the nucleus. They are still in the same energy level, that same orbital that we talked about the other day. So what ends up happening is as you move down a group, 
the size will definitely increase because we have filled the energy level that came before it, which is why we had those electro electron configurations that were the same for everything in group one. They all ended something S1. They have one valence electron and they get further and further away from the nucleus. When you move left to right across a period, we get what's called a shielding effect. All of the protons are going into the same nucleus while the electrons are going into the same energy level and so they are not any further away and they get pulled in closer by a stronger attraction by the nucleus. Our third trend is called ionization energy, which now kind of relates back to what we just talked about. The size also contributes to the ionization energy. So first, let's define this term ionization energy. It is the amount of energy that is required to remove an electron from a given element. Um, from an atom of a given element. So how much energy, the amount of energy required to remove an electron from an atom, it's going to be different if I have a big atom. Those electrons are further away from the nucleus and it won't be very difficult to remove the electron. So metals have low ionization energies, but non-metals are going to have higher ionization energies. And in fact, this trend is super easy. As you move down a column, the ionization energy gets less. So we say that it increases as we move up. And now in this case, what we're looking at is do metals and nonmetals have the same capability of drawing electrons in, giving up electrons, and they don't. Metals want to lose electrons, so they have low ionization energy. It doesn't take very much energy to make them remove them while metals have high or non-metals have high ionization energies because they want to gain electrons. You may remember this from middle school, junior high somewhere, where they talked about the non-metals wanting to gain electrons to form charged particles and to form bonds, and the non and the metals want to lose them so that they can form bonds with the non-metals. So the trend is increasing up and to the right. It is super simple. The lower left, francium, radium, cesium, barium, have very low ionization energies and they're very vigorous reactivities. Fluorine, oxygen, chlorine, sulfur, upper right corner, but not counting the noble gases. They have strong amounts of holding on to the electrons. And so it takes a lot more energy to remove those electrons. They have the highest ionization energies. And honestly, the noble gases have even higher ionization energies because they don't want to lose electrons at all. Uh, however, helium, those first electrons are so close to the nucleus that they are harder to pull them off than neon would be. And finally, the fourth trend that we look at is called the electronegativity. Now, this is a term that we haven't talked about at all. It is, we're introducing this term now to start to understand things later. Electronegativity is the amount of pull or tug or the amount of attraction that an atom has on electrons when it's in a bond or when it's compounded with another atom. So the electronegativity is the pull on the electrons, right? Metals don't want to pull electrons in. Non-metals do. So metals have a very low electronegativity. Non-metals have a high electronegativity, but the noble gases in this case have no electronegativity because they don't have any attraction. They do not want to gain electrons. They don't want to lose electrons. They are totally content. This is part of why we call them the noble gases. They have no desire to gain or lose electrons. So the trend ignoring the noble gases is that electronegativity will increase as we move up and will increase as we move to the right. There are minor exceptions to all of these. We're going to ignore the exceptions and we're going to talk only about the trends. So hydrogen and lithium and sodium and potassium being on the far left, they have lower electronegativities than anything to the right of them. Hopefully this made a little bit of sense. Well, after the activity that you did in class on Monday, this should be a review of those things that you noticed as you did the little uh, periodic table activity. There will be another video soon. Hope you are enjoying this way of taking notes, and we will talk more about the next topic soon.